Hi, this is Paul, and I hope to pull some things together in this video. I, I struggled this week with video making. I had a lot of randos conversations, and those were great. But I, I struggled with sort of pulling thoughts together, and often when that happens, I struggle because uh, things are going to start to gel. And so I had to do a little bit of extra reading and some working on some things. But things have been moving in this corner a lot lately. Uh, the Symbolic World summit is going on as i speak and i got a virtual pass i did a live stream this morning and i've been watching some of the speakers at the symbolic world conference over the last few months we've had this this big opening of new youtube channels and whereas it, it was either sort of friends of principals in the corner like Jordan Peterson or Verveke or Peugeot or Rando sort of coming up through me that would sort of bring people onto the stage. People have been sort of coming up on their own through starting YouTube channels or doing this or doing that. We had a we had a, an estuary event in Battleground, Washington, which is sort of impromptu, and we had about 40-ish people there, which really surprised me just how many people showed up to that event. And so the way things go with this is that they you get these spurts. Things are seldom sort of even. You have these you have these moments, and we're we're currently having a Kairos moment. And one of those, I think, Justin Brierley's podcast is a part of that. And very clearly, the the news of the baptism and conversion of Jordan Hall is a big piece of that too. So just this week. John Verveke and Jordan Hall released a video conversation. It was a delightful conversation. And it's it's it was a little hard to follow in some ways, but that's not hard to imagine given sort of the way both Jordan Hall and John Verveke talk, but it was it was lovely in that for me it was, you know, it was real reassurance that hmm, people can convert into Christianity and and still be good conversation partners whereas of course John has spoken with many of us who are committed Christians and we've had wonderful conversations um, to have someone like Jordan Hall enter the fold of Christianity that that certainly um, caused some trepidation and in fact at battle battleground I talked to one guy who came down from Nate Hiles estuary group and he's a part of some of these groups that are sort of out there in the wake of Rebel Wisdom's dissolution. And he told me that Jordan Hall's conversion is all that these groups can talk about. It's it's the only topic that they're talking about. It's People are just trying to get their minds around his conversion. And I think a number of us have been feeling, again, this is, this is, this is, this is widespread. I said this morning, Stephen Swartz was on came onto the live stream and and he's a he's a friend of Richard Rowland and came to faith and is a personal friend of Richard Rowland and so was talking about that. And I said, you know, the Orthodox, they might not use this word, but they are having something of a revival in America right now. And I think that's something to be celebrated. And so I'm I'm really happy for that. And I think Justin Brierley is noting that there's something of a revival going on at a certain level. And and something similar happened about 90 years ago, and C.S. Lewis was part of that. Um, and there were a whole bunch of sort of noteworthy academics and intellectuals who came to faith, and then others came to faith. And this is this is sort of a continual pattern in the church. And so I, I'm not surprised by any of this, but with each new wave, there's sort of a, a new assessment that has to take place. And I think now in the internet age, unlike sort of this mini revival that happened amongst English intellectuals in the 1930s, of which C.S. Lewis was a part. I, I think we're seeing a much bigger wave that has to do with the internet, and and I think this could very much be a time similar to the 16th century, when the end of the 15th century, beginning of the 16th century, when everything began to change. Uh, that was not the slide I wanted. This is the slide I wanted. And as I was, 
uh, I've sort of been troubled in that I couldn't just do what I do normally and out it would flow and just, you know, I started a bunch of videos and I canned them and I started some and I canned them and I really hate that because I like being very efficient with my time and it was hopelessly inefficient to spend two hours making a video that I don't bother publishing really annoys me. But then, you know, you go to bed and you think about these things and you wake up early in the morning and you pray and you ponder and and then I was, I've been listening to Carlos Erie's the Re, you know Reformations which I think is an excellent book now rereading it again and you know I'm thinking about how how to handle the Heidelberg Catechism on YouTube I'm leaning more and more towards doing it and it just occurred to me that in many ways John Verveke is the Erasmus of this new Reformation when I talked to Ron Dart four or five years ago, and Ron Dart had just published a book on Erasmus called The Little Bird, and he was sort of comparing Jordan Peterson to, and he had recommended the book Fatal Discord, which I read then, and he was sort of likening Jordan Peterson to Erasmus. I never thought that was right. Temperamentally, Peterson is much more of a Luther. And when it comes to the university, <laughs> when it comes to the university, this John Verveke as Erasmus and Peterson as Luther really sort of works because John continues to have a good relationship with the university and, and John's work continues to be academic. And in that way, Erasmus never left the church, even though he was doing really groundbreaking work. Some people would say that Erasmus laid the egg that Luther hatched, which was the Protestant Reformation. And temperamentally, Peterson is much more of a Luther and his story is much more of a Luther in terms of he, he's, you know, they're both were professors. And, but Luther is, I mean, Peterson, you back him into a corner and, and he won't back down. He's just irascible and stubborn in that way that, you know, you just, you just look at what happened with Martin Luther and, and the Reformation. I mean, it, you just had this escalation and we've seen that escalation with Peterson and, and Verveke, not so much. He's much more irenic and he's, he's, you know, he's a scholar and an intellectual and a philosopher and a cognitive scientist, and he's at the forefront of his field, and that's very Erasmian. And so I just got the sense of John Verveke as the Erasmus of this new Reformation. And you always have to be careful with that word Reformation, but now that the word has sort of been diluted by the likes of Carlos Erie and much of the scholarship around the Reformation that has happened in the last few decades has been sort of demoting the Protestant Reformation and recognizing that there's there's a whole slew of Reformations that were happening at the same time, not just Luther and the Protestants. And of course, you have the Anabaptists and the Radical Reformation and, and so much sort of broke loose. I was talking to Kel Zeldin about this on the live stream today and he mentioned it too. Many of the scholars who are doing this work around the Reformation period, they, they sort of are annoying some Protestant scholars, but they're making the point, like Carlos Erie, Reformations. Now, what where also, Verve, also Verveke is like Erasmus is, is while, while Erasmus sort of gave the tools that Luther would use and read the Vulgate and then read the Greek text and 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 see, wow, this 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 Bible that we have from Jerome, well, what is it? And, and in many ways, this is what Verveke has been doing. He's been saying, this science that we have received from the Enlightenment, what is it? And whenever I talk to John Verveke, I might say the scientific revolution or the scientific method. He'll say, you know, there are multiple scientific methods. And I mean, he's always correcting me in this because well, I'm not a scientist. I don't know this. But John knows it in spades. And so and he's given us all this vocabulary. And yeah, John, I know when we say fancy Verveke words, that's but we say it lovingly and we really, and, and because we aspire to learn these fancy Verveke words because they're not easy for us. And it's all taking us a while to catch up to you. And we're all sort of doing it at our different speeds. But John Verveke has given us this language. And then, of course, when Jordan Hall starts talking about the religion that's not a religion, and a number of us are talking about, yeah, Christianity has always been the religion that's not a religion. And I know people will hear that, and, and oh, that just sounds like pastor's tricks, you know. 
These are these are past that pastor mind tricks that we do on people. But there's a real sense in that this Judeo-Christian tradition has always been a religion that's not a religion. And that's what this video is going to be about. And now I, I've mentioned many times that during sort of the rise of one of the important reformations and awakenings that has happened in our lifetime, which we've taught, touched on a little bit, which was sort of the Jesus people movement, that it's, it's interesting how many people in this corner have their roots in that movement and the megachurch has its roots in that movement. And so we're still working through that enlightenment. One of the favorite phrases in that, and in, in that, in that awakening, in that, let's call it an awakening, in the awakening of the Jesus movement was Christianity isn't a religion, it's a relationship. And I often, again, this isn't directly from born again. You can, you can find the, you can find the moment in, in, in Chuck Carlson's Born Again when sort of Chuck Carlson, his life is a mess. He's, he's sort of gone to the mat for Richard Nixon and realized Richard Nixon is just fine with him going to jail for him. <laughs> it's not unlike other presidents that, that are around. Um, and and he's, he's torn up and he meets these evangelicals in Washington and he comes home and he tells his wife, honey, I've become a Christian. And she's like, I thought we were Episcopalian. We, we're Christian nationalists already. <laughs> the whole, all of America is about Christian nationalism. We've always been. Why do you think we have all these cathedrals in places like Duke Luna University and, and, um, and, and Wellesley College? We, and, and Harvard, you know, was a divinity school and branched out from there. America has always been a Protestant Christian nation. That's what we were about. But of course, that was changing. And not enough historians want to write that history because, well, they're the histories that you get in trouble for. And so when I talk about the religion that's not a religion, it also reminded me of before there was Jordan Peterson in my life, there was Tim Keller. And when I, in the middle of the aughts, sort of discovered and did my deep dive into Tim Keller for about five or six years, when he, what he was really on about in the middle of the aughts was Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is the anti-religion. And you can find tons and tons and tons of Tim Keller sermons, stuff in his books. He, he Like all preachers, he sort of went on to other themes after that, but 2006, 2007, you can find lectures and you can find it all on YouTube. You can find it in print. You can find it in his books. Uh, Christianity is not a religion because religion is, well, religion is how I earn my way up to God. Religion is how I work the system. Now, there's a ton of nuance that you can put into this. So don't push it too hard. It's a pastor's sermon illustration. It's rhetorical. But a religion that's not a religion is a deeply re rhetorical move. And... Well, now, the favorite, my favorite long portion of this video was John's apology. Now, apology doesn't mean I'm sorry. It was sort of John's confession where he sort of walks through. That was such a powerful, what he, what he put together, sort of, this is, this is who I am and where I'm at. And I think in some ways, Jordan Hall's conversion provoked a define the relationship moment in John. And of course, the deeper John gets into this, the more it's going to be because these legacy religions and the and the spirits that are in the culture are strong. And uh, the higher you climb that, the higher you climb that ladder, the, the rougher this gets. But he, he's been he's been refining this as he goes because ultimacy is inexhaustible in fact i think that is one of the determining features of reality being an inexhaustible fount of intelligibility my calling is the silk road the silk road is the enacted participation the pilgrimage presentation of this through line that i have just talked about and the point of the Silk Road is to 
offer those who need to seek a way of seeking for another home. Nobody lives on the Silk Road, but there are definitely seekers. But it is also a way for people to recover a home in Tolkien's sense, in the anthropologist sense. You travel to somewhere else, you put on a different set of glasses, and then you come back and T.S. Eliot, you see it again for the first time. T.S. Eliot was another one of those conversions in that wave in the early part of the 20th century. That is why I'm no longer talking about a religion that's not a religion. I am not trying to found a religion. And instead, I have now moved towards talking about the philosophical Silk Road. And this is what I feel most profoundly called to, to pilgrimage the through line and make it possible for other people. Why? I, I sense, and sense is too weak of a word, there's an advent of the sacred happening now beneath each one of these, between each one of these homes and beyond all of them, that is adventing a response to the global kairos around the meta-crisis and the meaning crisis and offering us a metanoia at the level of this global collective intelligence of a global distributed cognition that is needed, I believe, in order to, to potentially save us from catastrophe. I think he's right. I think he's right. And I see his role as very Erasmian in this. Now, I know that the Protestant Reformation, the one sparked by Luther and all of the other ways is a very controversial thing, but uh, it was inevitable, and this one is inevitable. And um, we're, we're going to have to work our way through it. And yet this religion that's not a religion, again, I'm a Christian minister. No spoilers here, boys and girls. <laughs> But this is this is this is where we're at. Uh, no, I still can't get that one. We'll get there. What what struck me in this was it was so funny because then I thought, well, I'll find a video clip of of Tim Keller on religion, and what I found actually was um, D -D um, DJ Chang now. DJ Chang has you popped up in the corner a bit here and there. You'll find him on Twitter, but I it was so it was so funny. September 25, 2006, and it's like, oh, I know just where I was in 2006. I was listening to remember that deep dive you did into Jordan Peterson? I was doing that into Tim Keller. I was listening to two, three, two or three hours of Tim Keller a day. Just 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 pounding it in any any lecture on YouTube. I was buying his sermons. I was listening to the MP3s, and then DJ Chang was putting up some web things about Tim Keller, and he saw all that I was blogging about him. So DJ and I were working together on on this TimKeller.info. It was a little wiki, and we're putting all that stuff in. And well, this was there's a Tim Keller did these talks at Google, which are really worth listening to. And um, but this was one that DJ put up here. <laughs> I don't want to trigger anybody. Luke, Luke, hang on to yourself. Well, one of the things that I think is important is to is to not talk about two ways, like there's God's way and there's man's way, or there's uh, obeying the Lord and. Uh, living your uh, and doing your own thing. I like to always talk about three ways. I think there's the gospel approach, there's, there's the moralistic religious approach, and there's the irreligious secular approach. And it's when the average irreligious secular postmodern person hears you calling people to Christ, unless you distinguish the gospel from religion and moralism, they assume that you're simply asking them to become better people, nicer, more moral. If you don't distinguish the gospel from religion, they just assume that you're just asking them to be a Pharisee. And uh, I think that's absolutely... Now, now, Jacob, Jacob, I know you're a Pharisee. <laughs> just don't get too upset. 
crucial, therefore, to always make a distinction between those three. Uh, there's a little essay by uh, C.S. Lewis in one of the, one of the is, is not very well known, called Three Kinds of Men. And in it, he basically talks about those three approaches. And that really struck me, and I've, I, that's, been a very, that's been a cornerstone of my own proclamation of the gospel. Contrast the three ways, not just two. And that's classic Tim Keller. You, you look at his sermon on the prodigal son, and at this point in 2006, Keller was putting out all of this stuff about um, Christianity is not a religion, Christianity as opposed to religion. You, you can find it all through his things. Now, now, again, this sounds like sort of just kind of a cheap pastor's trick, but um, I want to make the case that it really isn't. That And, you know, Nate Heil was saying the same thing. And, and it's interesting because I think on Grail Country, they're going to approach Christianity as the religion that's not a religion from sort of a different way that I will, which is fine. Um, but I'm going to bring back in this, this book. And it's a really good book. Um, now, this book is nearly impossible to get right now, and I'm sorry about that. I, I was making my videos, and someone pointed me to Christine Hayes' Yale lectures on the Old Testament, and I listened to it, and I'm a digger, and she mentioned Ezekiel Kaufman, and so I just went to Amazon, and I ordered the book. It was like seven bucks. Cool. Then, you know, it came. It's got a little bit of underlining in it, and you'll see it on some of the scans, and great. Um, and, uh, Raj, you, you wrote in my book, I saw this comment about Seeky and I thought Raj wrote in the, he borrowed it from me at one point. He wrote it in pencil. I can erase it if I want to. I won't erase it because I treasure it now because you did write in it and because it's from you. And many of you know who Raj is. Um, he's in Sacramento, but this, this book, um, I remember when I listened to Christine Hayes's lectures, like lights went off in terms of the meta divine realm and and not just the meta divine realm but what he really treats in this book which this religion that's not a religion actually predates jesus and goes back to the hebrew prophets and now kaufman doesn't treat jesus per se in this book but uh, not that i've seen i haven't read the whole thing but um now this is it was i um this is translated and abridged by moshe greenberg who is a some of you will recognize that name. He's a big, big deal in terms of Jewish scholarship. And uh, yeah, if I had to, if my office was on fire and I had to grab something out, I'd probably grab this book first. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a really big deal. So I, I scanned a bunch of it so I could show it here. And, and I want to read some of it and give you a sense of it. Chapter 1, The Basic Problem. If one examines the biblical account of the origins of Israelite monotheism and the story of its battle with and eventual triumph over paganism, he will discover a strange fact. The Bible is utterly unaware of the nature and meaning of pagan religion. The pre-exilic age was, according to the witness of the Bible, the age of Israelite idolatry. The people repeatedly backslid and worshipped the other gods of the nations round, Biblical literature is dedicated to fight idolatry, and, and biblical law, prophecy, and poetry have all left an abundant record of this generation's long battle. Biblical scholars of all shades of opinion have therefore assumed, as a matter of course, that the biblical age was intimately acquainted with paganism. No one apparently has even doubted this assumption or criticized it in the light of the data. Now, this I think he wrote in the 1930s, so this again was part of this this really remarkable period of the, the interwar period where really a lot of important things happened. No one apparently had ever double doubted the assumption or criticized it in the light of the data. It is taken for granted that the biblical age knew the God, knew the God beliefs of the pagans and their myths. For were these not part and parcel of the idolatry of Israel? The war upon idolatry is presumed to have struck at the myths as well. Now this is, What's really going to get interesting, and as you read this book, it's like part of what's happened as modernity has receded and as we are beginning, as, as basically cognitive science, John Verveke, Jordan Peterson, many, many others say, the world of the Enlightenment is not sort of this simplistic Lockean world that we can still find both Christians and atheists 
the new atheists just sort of they, they they left a piece of their religion behind but sort of kept it and that's the funny ways that you can watch the new atheists and modernistic christians agree and and complain together in some cases um But but where where why as this goes away, then suddenly you know it's mythology again, and we have to reassess myth and what's the relationship between myth and the Bible? And of course, I've greatly benefited from the insights of Jonathan Peugeot on that. But but Kaufman needs to be listened to. The war upon idolatry is presumed to have struck at the myths as well. Monotheism prevailed as Israel's evolving religious consciousness triumphed over pagan mythological beliefs. The time and manner of this victory are subject to debate among scholars, but it is agreed at every hand that during the biblical period, mythological polytheism was prevalent in Israel as elsewhere, and that biblical religion pro um, proper came into being only gradually as the product of the great struggle against it, and having a lot to do, quite likely, with the exile. There is, of course, no question that Israelite religion and paganism are historically related. Both are stages in the religious evolution of man. Israelite religion arose at a certain period in history, and it goes without saying that its rise did not take place in a vacuum. The Israelite tribes were heirs to a religious tradition that can only be polytheistic. The religion of the Lord could take hold of the people only after overcoming the ancient faith and the fossil remains of pagan notions that had been preserved in the Bible testify that it had never been wholly eradicated. Now, it's interesting when you get to sort of the Christian triumph over Roman paganism, is there perhaps some parallel in that struggle that's sort of first within Israel and later? Of course, that will be deeply controversial. Leave your comments below. But what was the nature of this upheaval, and what do we know of its history? The study of biblical religion hinges on the answer to this question. Studies of the origin of biblical religion inquire after the extent to which the popular religion and even the votaries of the Lord at first were recog recognized the existence of other gods. It is commonly assumed that the height of the, the height of the religion of the Lord began as henotheism or, mono, or monolatry, recognizing him as sole legitimate God in Israel, but acknowledging the existence of other national gods. This stage is said to be attested to in the biblical record. The problem is then posed, when did the idea arise that not only was Israel worship, um, what, when did the idea arise that not only was Israel's worship of other gods illegal, but that other gods had no reality whatsoever? Hmm. Now you can start to feel some of the some of the current conversation, can't you? For example, when did henotheism or monolatry become monotheism? This view is founded on the tacit assumption that the pagan gods were, gods were conceived of identically by both Israelite and pagan. This, is, this, is a, this book, this book, this book has me in a lot of ways. The passage from the earlier to the latter stage is taken as the repudiation of the pagan idea of the reality of gods. But what does the Bible itself tell us concerning the Israelite conception of the nature of these gods and the nature of their worship? The pagan conceives of the gods as powers embodied in nature. You remember I was reading some Thomas Carlyle. You can go through a bunch of that. Or as separate beings connected with nature in some fashion. Deification of cosmic forces provides the soil for growth of mythology. Popular religion conceives of the gods as persons who inhabit the entire universe and are related to specific ways to each other and to men. This is kind of standard ideas, especially 19th, early 20th century ideas. They are the heroes of popular myths, the subjects of, of epic poets. To them, temples are built, monuments and images erected. In the cult, material objects usually play an important part, the natural or manufactured objects being taken as the bearer of divine power, the dwelling place of deity or its symbol. While worship of material objects is not an essential feature of paganism, it is its natural outgrowth. Homage is done to the god through the care given to its image. The cult of images is thus intimately bound up with the belief in personal gods who have specific forms, who inhere in natural phenomena to or control them. The polytheism of the ancient Near East during biblical times was highly developed. 
Its gods and goddesses appear in literature, art, and culture in fairly standardized forms. And we know a lot more about this, thanks to archaeology, than even when Kaufman wrote in the 30s. Which were presumably familiar not only to the clergy, but to the laity as well. There are gods of sky and earth, of life, of love, of fertility, of death and destruction. The gods have specific roles. They are gods of light and darkness, of thunder and lightning, of wind and rain, of fire and water, mountain springs, rivers and forests. Have their gods also. The gods have sexual qualities, the existence of male and female deities being essential to pagan thought. These characteristics serve as material for elaborate myths in which histories and adventures of the gods are related. Theogonies tell of their birth and lineage. Myths tell of their loves, wars, hatreds, and dealings with them. The cult is closely connected with these myths, which are a vital core of priestly and, in measure, of popular religion. What would we know of this, had we no other source than the Bible? Hmm, there's an interesting question. He, this guy asks good questions. The Bible knows that pagan worship that the pagans worship national gods, certain of whom are mentioned by name: Baal, Asheroth, Chemoth, Milcon, Bel, Nebo, Ammon, etc. But it is remarkable that not a single biblical passage hints at the natural or mythological qualities of any of these named gods. Had we only the Bible, we should know nothing of the real nature of the gods of the nations. In a few isolated passages, the pagans are said to worship spirits and demons, but these are anonymous. Whereas what we know to have been mythological gods are, in the Bible, mere names. Not to trace remains, not a trace of the rich store of popular myths associated with these names. The Bible doesn't have them. Why not? It's strange. The Bible has a great deal to say about the image cult that was associated with named gods. But if the god is not understood to be living natural power or a mythological person who dwells in or is symbolized by the image, it is evident that the image worship is conceived to be nothing but fetishism. A few passages permit the inference that the nationals that the nations worshiped living gods, thus in the ancient poem of Numbers 21:29, Shemosh may be Chemosh, um, may be represented as active. Um, Jephthah too speaks of Shemosh as if he gave the land um, to the Ammonites, Judges 11.24. Belief in a living God, Baal, may be alluded to in the stories of Judges 6, telling of Gideon's destructions of his altar. Elijah's taunts also represent Baal, if only mockingly, as a living God. Similarly, 1 Kings 20, 28, has the pagans speak of the gods of the valleys and of the mountains, if indeed only in reference to the God of Israel. Apart from this, we find the notion that later became widespread amongst Hellenistic Jews and passed, um, passed from them to the Christians that the gods of the nations were spirits or demons. Deuteronomy 32, Psalm 106. It must be stressed, however, that this is a vaguely generalized conception. No named God of the Bible is so represented. In the above cited passages, the gods of the nations are alluded to not merely as cult objects, but as active beings, whether so in reality or in the mind of the heathen. Although it is possible that in some of the mere personifications of idols is intended, there can be no doubt that in a few there is a suggestion that the pagans worship not only idols, but gods and spirits as well, which would be completely natural. The there's something going on beyond, behind, within the image that, that we certainly assume. But the Bible doesn't talk that way. And, and that's what's really amazing about this book. Now, I have time constraints and can't read everything. i got to check my wife's... Um, Biblical writers are also aware of the pagans' belief that their idols have the power to act. The pagans worship and sacrifice to idols, hoping to receive benefit and aid from them. There's religion. It's right there. This is what you do. And in many ways, with the sort of in deism, in deism the, the See, deism sort of absorbs God number one until Jordan Peterson sort of brings it back out in his 
first staged conversation with with Sam Harris. That's again, I've been talking about that since I was listening to them and Jordan Peterson, you know, they're getting to the end of the evening and and Sam Harris is getting a little frustrating because I, I, I want to, Sam Harris, I want to know what you mean by God. And, and of course, they're going <laughs> to, it's another, t- Jordan Peterson is the end of question and answers. He, he sort of re- wrecked Father Stephen DeYoung's question and answer time when Jordan had a question and that was the whole question and answer time. But, and that first Sam Harris thing, you find the video of it, no question and answer because Sam Harris, I, I want to know if, I want to know if, if you masturbate, if God cares. Of all questions to really want, I guess it very much pertains to this little reformation that happened as a result of Jordan Peterson answering a question like that. And he opens up his his computer and he begins to read how he believe what he understands God to be. And I listen to him and I think, boy, that sure sounds a lot like the Heidelberg Catechism and the Belgic Confession. These late medieval, early modern articulations of what these reformers assumed their Catholic rivals would understand as rightful articulations of God. And Sam Harris, well, he's responding to a super thing in the sky. He's responding to the God that Chuck Colson comes home and tells his wife he has a personal relationship with. And it's like, oh, number one and number two. God as arena, God as agent. What's happening here? Well, religion, this is what Tim Keller would say over and over and over again, is making the sacrifices and doing the worship and rituals. Now, of course, this is going to be a big deal in terms of the Protestant Reformation. We're working on the same things. We're just in a different time than the 16th century. We have now arrived at the limit of the Bible's knowledge of the nature of pagan belief. Now, again, this isn't the limit of the biblical author's knowledge of the nature of pagan belief. This is the limit of the Bible's knowledge as a book, literally. One of the great moments in the conversation between John and Jordan Hall was when Jordan Hall very nicely defines literally. It's there on the page. You can refer to it. It doesn't change. You mean physically? No, I mean... It's there on the text, because if you go all the way back to my earlier videos, back in the early days of me doing videos, and I'm running through the Protestant Reformation, well, what happened in the Protestant Reformation, thanks to Erasmus, was everything paid attention to the book, to the words. Why were they all getting these Latin names? Ursinus, writer of the Heidelberg Catechism. His name was Bear in German, which means bear. He changed it to Ursinus, which is Latin for bear. You know, they all changed that. Many of them changed their name to, to Latin names. Why? That was a very literal literary age. And it was the literal, it was the literal conflict that was happening thanks to Erasmus opening up the polyglot and saying, here's the Vulgate, here's the Greek. What was Jerome doing? Adding all those words and ideas into the Bible. We find no clear conception of the roles of the gods play in nature and in the life of man. No cognizance is taken of their mythological features. The named gods are characterized only by the nations that worship them. Ashtoreth, the god of the Sidonians, Milcon, the abomination of the Ammonites, Shemosh, the abomination of of Moab, and so forth. No god is ever styled according to the function or place in the pantheon as so often occurs in the literatures of Egypt, Mesopotamia, and Canaan. Nor is the sexual differentiation of the gods ever alluded to. Gods and goddesses are both comprised under the masculine rubric Elohim. There being, in fact, no word in the biblical Hebrew for goddess. Well, that's interesting. Observe now what is said regarding the worship of the host of heaven. Several of the named gods, Ishtar, Bel, Marduk, Nebo, etc., are known from pagan sources to have been astral deities, yet not once does the Bible connect them to the worship of the host of heaven. The host and the idols, 
For example, the name-bearing images are always treated as two distinct classes of pagan deities. Thus, Deuteronomy 4, 16 through 18 first forbids worshiping images of any animal winged or earthbound following this, verse 19, with a separate prohibition to the sun, the moon, and the host of heaven as the sun and moon and host of heaven are repeatedly listed alongside of, not as identical with other gods. Thus, to the queen of heaven, Jeremiah 44, apparently the moon, is never identified in the Bible with Ashtoreth or any other deity that the Bible knows by name. And although Ezekiel sees the elder bowing down eastward to the sun, he fails to, to link this solar cult with that of the idols of Israel, which he saw just before in Ezekiel 8.16. Nor does he give any hint that this is deified, that this deified son bears any of the personal mythological traits of the Assyrio, the, the Assyrio Babylonian Shamish. And that the Bible calls the worship of the host of heaven, it apparently understands to be the cult of the heavenly bodies as such. It knows of no connection between the hosts of heaven and the named gods whose idol worship it condemns. Now again, this doesn't mean that the biblical authors didn't know the connection, but the Bible intentionally writes it this way. Why? It's strange. The mythological motifs that are found in the Bible are considered evidence of pagan influence on Israel religion during biblical times. The question here is this, did Israel, after the rise of the religion of the Lord, take over the myths of pagans along with their idols? The fact is that the Bible recognizes no mythological motifs as foreign or pagan. In all the, le in all the legends and allusions to such motifs, the Lord is the only active divine being. There are no active foreign gods. There are allusions to battle that the Lord fought with primeval creatures such as Rahab and his helpers, the dragon, Leviathan, and the fleeing serpent. But these are not considered by the biblical writers as pagan concepts, whatever be their true historical derivation. They belong to Israel's stock of legends and may well be a legacy of pre-Israelite times. Such creatures appear in Israelite legends, but never Tiamat, Marduk, Hadad, or the like. The myths of the pagans are not even derided as idle tales, as fabrications, nor as they nor are they utilized in poetic figures. Now you can read, you can definitely read biblical texts in contrast, and it's it seems quite clear that the biblical authors are conversant with the mythologies, but they're not doing what we would expect them to do. And, and that's the genius of Kaufman, of Kaufman's observation. Quite remarkably is the fact that precisely in the, crea in the creation legends, Genesis 1 through 11, where the bulk of mythological matter is embedded, paganism is entirely absent. Primeval man knows only of the God of Israel. In some then, there is no evidence that the writers were conscious of any connection between the mythological motifs embedded in their narratives in the pagan gods. These phenomena go too deep and are too pervasive to be explained merely as monotheistic reworking. Moreover, while monotheism could not acknowledge the divinity of the pagan gods, it need not have denied them legendary roles. We have seen that occasionally the Bible does allow them the status of demons. These might have been permitted to play the part of evil spirits or enemies of the Lord. A battle with Bel and Nebo as demons is no more damaging to the unity of, of God than a battle with Rahab or the dragon. Later, Judaism saw no harm in stories of God's battle with rebellious angels. This is not to say that the Bible knows of no battles of the Lord with the gods of the nations. Indeed, the Lord does battle with them and works judgment upon them. But in every case, the objects of his fury are idols as we see them. These complementary phenomena can only be explained on the assumption that the biblical age no longer knew pagan mythology. Just as no foreign god is active in the creation story, so no god other than the Lord ever appears at work in Israel's early history or in the battles between Israel and his neighbors. The Lord fights Israel's enemies, but no god ever appears as his living antagonist. You can see in many ways that in some ways what we see as secular already has its roots here. 
that we don't find when God battles the Midianites, we don't see a story of some of the Lord portrayed as some great man or a bird or 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 some great monster, and then he takes battle. You know, it's not it's not Pacific, it's not Pacific Rift that is happening here. It's very curious. We're just accustomed to it because it's the Bible we have. Thus the Lord works judgments on the gods of Egypt. Exodus 12, 12, Numbers 33, 4. And similar expressions are to be found elsewhere. Isaiah 46, 1, with regard to Baal and Nebo. In several cases, it is not clear whether the reference is to the gods or the idols. But we may interpret these in the light of unequivocal passage passages. Jeremiah follows, I shall punish Baal in Babylon. I shall punish the graven images of Babylon. Nahum warns Assyria, I shall cut off idol and molten image from your temple. And so does Ezekiel's prophecy, I shall destroy idols and put them to the to end to images in Memphis. Bel is shamed. Merodach dismayed, um, Merod, um, Merodach dismayed is interpreted by the prophet in very next clause. Her images are shamed, her idols dismayed. From the total absence of any reference to activity, such as, say, flight, which would be appropriate in such cases, we may conclude that such expressions as trembling and kneeling refer to the movement of idols being cut down and removed from their sites. Iconoclasm. It is characteristic that instead of fleeing, the pagan gods must be borne away on pack animals or are carried off into exile with their priests. The account of the humiliation of the Philistine god Dagon in 1 Samuel 5, the only detailed story of judgments that the Lord wreaks on the gods of the god of the nations, may serve as a model for all such judgments. The Philistines captured the ark and set it up in the temple of Dagon, beside Dagon. The Lord's revenge strikes at the people of Ashdod through a vile disease, god number one. And Dagon is discovered one morning fallen on his face before the ark of the Lord. On the morrow, not only is he fallen, is he again fallen, but Dagon's head and his two hands are cut off, and he's lying on the threshold. Ashdodites decide to get rid of the ark of the God of Israel because his hand was laid heavy upon us and our God Dagon. See, again, we sort of jump to the imaginative. But the Bible sticks to the idol. We hear nothing of Dagon proper. Dagon, the living God. Not even the Philistines are said to suggest that the fall of the image portends evil for the God. They too see in their idols' fall and mutilation the judgment of the Lord on their God. This is how Israel told the stories, told the victories of the Lord over the gods of the nations. We should not wonder that the Bible speaks of the Lord judging these idol gods. The idols are vanities. It is true, but they are more. They are not religiously neutral, but a source of impurity. Even though it is emphasized over and over again that there are no gods as objects of a magical cult, the biblical writers hold them in a measure of awe. The Bible does not believe in magic and sorcery and considers the idols as bearers of occult power. It is as such that the Lord, the God, wreaks his judgment upon them. And he tells two stories. Um, you have Nebuchadnezzar. The larger, the large, now to the next section, the large part of biblical literature is dedicated to the battle against idolatry, striving to expose its absurdity and discredit it in the eyes of the believers. When this material is examined, it appears, A, that the gods whom the pagans believe to inhabit earth and heaven are never said to be non-existent. B, that nowhere is the belief in myths or their telling prohibitive. C, that no biblical writer utilizes mythological motifs in his polemic. D, that the sole argument against pagan religion is that it is a fetishistic worship of wood and stone. Now, what's interesting is that in a lot of biblical scholarships, you can read sort of, I think people are reading mythological motifs into it because they expect to find it, so they sort of find it behind the text. But what's stark about what Kaufman points out is that, but it isn't, forefronted in the text. The biblical text is different. And this text, the difference of this text, then basically makes all the contrast with the other texts 
all that more vivid. The Bible conceives of idolatry as the belief that divine and magical powers inhere in certain natural or man-made objects, and that the Bible and that man can activate these powers through fixed rituals. Again, if you read something like this and you think about the reformers, the Protestant reformers, boy, you can fear the echoes. The Bible does not conceive the powers as being, as personal beings who dwell in the idols. The idol is not a habitation of the God. It is the God himself. Hence the oft-repeated biblical stigmatization of the pagan gods as wood and stone, silver and gold, hence also its sole polemical argument that idol is the senseless deification of wood and stone images. You see that corrosive... Um, you see, you see that demythologizing, we come by it naturally if you come from the Bible. And of course, Tom Holland picks this up when he starts Dominion, he starts with the Hebrew prophet. Tom Holland sees this. We may perhaps say that the Bible sees in paganism only its lowest level, the level of, of, Mana beliefs. This view finds clear expression in the prophetic polemics against idolatry. Literary prophecy brought the religion of the Lord to its climax. Chapter upon chapter records denunciations hurled at apostate Israel for their straying after the gods of the nations. If ever there was a struggle with pagan myths and mytho mythological conceptions of deity, we should expect to find traces of it here. But we search in vain. Not one word have the prophets for mythological beliefs. Not only do they repudiate them, not, not once do they repudiate them. Not only do they fail to brand the pagan gods as demons or satyrs, they fail to even clearly to deny their existence. In short, the prophets ignore what we know to be authentic paganism. Their whole condemnation revolves around the taunt of fetishism. I always have trouble saying that word. Fetishism. Goes into Amos, first three chapters of Hosea, Lot Micah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Lot and Ezekiel. The basic problem. The makers of idols are all of them a mockery. Their beloved idols are good for nothing. The workman in wood draws a measuring line over it, shapes it with a pencil, works it with planes, shapes it with compasses, makes it into the likeness of a man with a beauty like that of human form to sit in a house. And on and on it goes. Over again, the, the prophet ridicules the belief that inanimate objects are gods. What's interesting about our current, our current moment is that in many ways, that's where the materialists are. The materialists have so deeply brought into that and on one level, and it's proper to say so, they are deeply Protestant, but they are not, not deeply Hebraic or biblical in this sense. The seeds of this demythologizing, of this, you know, part of what we're looking at in terms of deconstruction and reconstruction, uh, waves of obsession, again, one of the new waves that have come up, he talks about how science killed his love of the rainbow. And it's a wonderful video. But so this is this is the first point that 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 Kaufman hits. And then he'll hit about idolatry and the laws. And he'll go on and he'll make a similar point in there. The verdict of the Bible upon pagan religion is too pervasive to be explained as the product of artifice and later editing. Nothing can make plausible the suspension of a polemic against polytheistic belief had such polemic been in existence. Does the Bible portray pagan religions as mere fetishism? Because the writers themselves disbelieved in the gods? If it were so, the writers must have failed in their primary objective, which was to undermine the faith of those who believed in them. To this end, there was no point in belaboring the fetish argument to the entire exclusion of the main claim that the gods were non-existent. As a matter of fact, it is abundantly clear that the writers naively attribute their own point of view to the idolaters. The prophets, the prophets look for the end of idolatry at the time when the idolaters will come to understand that man cannot make him gods and that wood and stone cannot save. 
There's no hint, of course, that Sennacherib ascribes his triumphs to the god Asher, who triumphs over the gods of the nations. It may be suggested that the biblical polemic takes this form because, in fact, the mass of people did not have fetishistic concept of the idols, and it was urge, urgently necessary to combat and it. Now there was, to be sure, a fetishistic side to paganism. The cult was bound up with an image. The image was, in a sense, the god. This consideration can explain why the fetishistic argument plays an important part in the biblical polemic. It cannot explain, however, the total absence of polemic against the belief in living gods, which was, after all, the root and heart of pagan religion. Greek thinkers and their attacks upon the popular religion gave due attention to its fetishistic aspect. But they did not permit this to distract them from combating the popular myths. You can read it in Plato. Nor did later Jewish and Christian polemics rest content with fetishistic arguments only. And yet we find that the Bible fails entirely to come to grips with the essence of polytheistic belief in gods. It is clear now that the question as to the origin of Israelite monotheism has been erroneously formulated. We cannot ask whether it was during the pre-prophetic or prophetic age that the religion of the Lord came to deny the reality of foreign gods. The Bible nowhere denies the existence of gods. It ignores them. That's such a key statement. In contrast to the philosophic attacks on Greek popular religion, and in contrast to the later Jewish and Christian polemics, biblical religion shows no trace of having undertaken deliberately to suppress and repudiate um, mythology. There is no evidence that the gods and their myths were ever a central issue in the religion of the Lord. And yet this religion is non-mythological. Fossil remains of ancient myths cannot obscure the basic difference between Israelite religion and paganism. It is precisely this non-mythological aspect that makes it unique in world history. This was the source of its universal appeal. There, 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 there you go. There you go, Raj. Here's your little note. I knew it was you. Only you would make a comment in this about Siki. We designate as pagan all religions of mankind from the beginning of recorded history to the present except Israelite religion and its, deriv and its derivatives, Christianity and Islam. This distinction assumes that, to the one hand, there is something unique about Israelite religion that sets it off from all the rest, and on the other, that there is an essential common aspect to all other religions which give them their pagan character. What is that common essence? This is where you get the meta divine rem. Paganism has embodied in itself an enormity of variety of forms in deification of the animate and inanimate, in beliefs in spirits and demons, in magic and incant incantations. It knows lofty cosmic gods and has produced the longing for knowledge and communion with the world soul. It evolved profound religious systems which sought to comprehend the secrets of existence of life and death, of the destiny of man and the universe. It envisioned the triumph of good over evil at the end of days. Paganism bore such exotic fruit as the religion of the Australian aborig um, aboriginals and that of the tribes of Africa and America. Such delicate flowers as Greek thought and the speculations of Babylon and Egypt, India, China, and Persia, all their complex ramifications. Yet all these embodiments evolve one idea which is the distinguishing mark of pagan thought. The idea that there exists a realm of being prior to the gods and above them, upon which the gods depend, and whose decree must be obeyed. Deity belongs to and is derived from a primordial realm. This realm is conceived of variously as darkness, water, spirit, earth, sky, and so forth, but always as the womb in which the seeds of all being are contained. Alternatively, this idea appears as a belief in a primordial realm beside the gods, as independent and primary as the gods themselves. Not being subject to the gods, it necessarily limits them. First conception, however, is the fundamental one. This is to say that in the pagan view, the gods are not the source of all that there is, 
nor do they transcend the universe. They are rather part of a realm um, precedent to and independent to them. They are rooted in this realm, are bound by this nature, are subservient to its laws. To be sure, paganism has personal gods who create and govern the world of men, but a divine will, sovereign and absolute, which governs all and is the cause of all being, such a conception is unknown. There are heads of pantheons, there are creators and maintainers of the cosmos, but transcending them is the primordial realm, which is pre-existent, autonomous, which its pre-existence, which its pre-existent autonomous forces. This is the radical dichotomy of paganism, from which um, from it springs both mythology and magic. Myth is the tale of the life of the gods. The gods emerge out of the primordial substance, having been generated by its boundless fertility. And again, you do not find in the beginning that God somehow comes up out of the sea. You'll find in Daniel 7 that the monsters come out of the sea. But of course, God does not come out of the sea. Where does the sea come from? Well... God makes all that there is. But then, where is God? What is God? A super thing in the sky? No sky can contain him. The Bible's very clear on that. I scanned 100 pages of this, so we're not going to get through it. It is not the plurality of gods, per se, then, that expresses the essence of polytheism, but rather the notion of many independent power entities, all on a par with one another, and all rooted in the primordial realm. Just as, fundamental, just as the fundamental idea of paganism found in poetic expression is in myth, so it's found practical expression in magic. Because what magic is, is... Working the impersonal machinery of the meta-divine realm to accomplish things. In this way, gods are magicians and gods are priests. And he goes through all of that. And he's just got ample example after example of how this whole thing, how this whole thing runs. The mark of monotheism is not the concept of God who is creator, um, is not the concept of a God who is creator, eternal, benign, or even all-powerful. These notions are found elsewhere in the pagan world. It is rather the idea of a God who is the source of all being, not subject to a cosmic order, and not emergent from a pre-existent realm, a God free of the limitations of magic and mythology. The high gods of primitive tribes do not embody this idea. This is where you get the meta-divine sphere. The diviner need not work always through gods or spirits. They also work through omens. Um, he also works through omens alone and through some native supernatural faculty that frees him from dependence upon the goodwill of the gods. As such, he is a scientist who can dispense with divine revelation. And you see right there, why did Israel have this really profound uh, prohibition against divination. Well, you can see it right here, and 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 hence also what they said about the idols of wood and stone. There is no getting around God number one. The pagan set path, the pagan way to salvation. Subjection of both men and gods to a transcendent realm is symbolized by myth and concretized in the cult. This common lot is what gives meaning to the magical, irrational cult. Men share in the life and destiny of the gods, imitate their actions and rites, and commemorate events in their lives. They are the mythological foundation upon which the cult is grounded. And yet, it is prevalent idea that the rites have autonomous value and innate efficacy. The groundwork is thus laid for bypassing the gods, to address the ultimate realm upon which they themselves are dependent. This tendency does not represent a magical stage of religion. The notion of the intrinsic efficacy of the ritual is sufficient to turn attention to the meta-divine realm and to arouse efforts to attain salvation directly through it. The most advanced manifestation of paganism shows a tendency to regard man as able to save himself by his own devices. 
You can hear this in Tim Keller when he talks about gospel versus religion. Keller makes the point again and again and again and again. The point about gospel is you can't save yourself. You are saved. You are the subject. You are um, you are the object of God's salvation. He saves you. You can't save yourself. Paganism is fundamentally you have to save yourself. The cult rises above the commonplace concerns of rain, produce, fertility, and victory to the vision of salvation. At this level, man may be viewed as the ally of the gods in their struggle with evil, that is, at bottom, as a co-savior with the gods, Zoroastrianism. Or the tendency may be towards the magical, with the cult regarded as a system of rites capable of exalting man to divine rank and thus saving him from evil. Salvation, however, is his own concern, not the gods. At most, they but help him find the hidden way, Brahmanism. But paganism may attain the philosophic and metaphysical level. Here, salvation is no longer a matter of ritual, but knowledge of the secrets of being and non-being, life and death. Man liberates himself through the mind and spirit from the prison of the body into the dreary cycle of death and rebirth, Gnosticism and Buddhism. The sublimest height is reached in the Platonic doctrine, which teaches man how to redeem himself through attachment to the idea of to the realm of ideas. Paganism, in all its manifestations, thus recognizes a transcendent metadivine realm. There it seeks the key to the destiny of the world and the salvation of man. In the next chapter on Israelite religion, he'll go through many of the things that have probably arisen in your mind about the primordial sea and all of this imagery of chaos and order that we're pretty familiar with talking about. He'll address, he'll address those kinds of things there. But again, this, you know, I've got 100 pages scanned here. Now, I've started going through again Carlos Erie's excellent book on Reformations, the early modern period, 1450 to 1650. And as I, as I spoke with Kale about, it, he, he, sets, he sets the Reformation. It was interesting comparing notes with Kale on the history, church history, a Catholic's version of the Reformation period versus, let's say, a Dutch Calvinist version of the Reformation period. We got told two different stories. <laughs> I, think, I think Carlos Erie does a really nice job of, of setting the context in a whole bunch of in a whole bunch of different ways but but seeing these these tensions he he, he has a really nice chapter on religion in, in late medieval christendom and i think this is definitely not a a piece of protestant um he, he just i think in a very even-handed way just walks through the elements of late medieval piety how it worked the various um, characters that are at work, what miracles are. Now, one of the things that very much clearly comes through is that there are a variety of dichotomies that are happening that are happening in the Reformation period. That the sort of the long soak of Christianity from the fourth century, to the 6th, 15th, and 16th century brought about a lot of, let's say, natural habits of humanity with respect to popular religion, let's call it. And the kinds of, it, it, it was, it, it often seems the case that today, as we look back on the Protestant Reformation, that many of the, made it, many of the, Protestant reformers were pastors of people with an eye to popular religion. And they very much saw that a lot of what might be considered magic or magical ritual was what the reformers attempted to attack. Now, did they throw too much baby out with bathwater? Part of what we've been seeing over the last 500 years is sort of Protestants and Catholics continue to renegotiate this. Part of what I like about Erie's book is that he not only deals with Germany and um, 
and beyond, but he deals with Italy, France, and you know many more places, the ways that Catholic reform moved as well, in some way in sort of addressing the Protestants, but part of it would, of course, be rivalry against the Protestants, but part of it would be addressing the very legitimate concerns that the Protestant reformers had with the Roman Church. And as someone had mentioned to me years ago, one of the most effective Catholic reformers in all of human history was Martin Luther. <laughs> it nearly cost him his life. It cost uh, a good bit of Europe to Catholicism. It, again, would completely rewrite the map of it created America. So a lot came from this, but these tensions that you can see Kaufman seeing in terms of Israel versus paganism are there. And again, it is, it is a, I wouldn't say it's a linguistic trick, but it's definitely a rhetorical move to look at this heart of religion that emerges from the Hebrew prophets and, and how that then flourishes in terms of Christianity, in terms of what Paul does with respect to the paganism that's in the Roman Empire with the triumph of Christianity over paganism in the Roman world, that long triumph, with which actually takes century after century as Christianity moves, as Christianity then has to contend with the gods of the Norsemen and how Christianity very quickly conquers the Norsemen, which, again, if you watch any of these new shows on Vikings, you watch these shows, and if, if you watch the show, you would almost get the sense that, well, you know, surely the Christians lost this, but no, they won. And, and how could they, as a religion, you know, they have these great scenes in, um, in, in many of these shows now where, you know, the, it's sort of like the Norsemen are like Donald Trump talking about um, John McCain. No, we like our gods not crucified, although there is Odin on that tree. But, you know, and so this is, a, this is an interesting, nuanced, amazing tale of, of drama through the ages. But when you come to the Protestant Re Reformation and you understand what there is implicit, you can understand where the Protestant reformers, when they go back to the Bible and they read it, now they can read it, they can afford it, they can compare texts of it, they can study Hebrew. They're all going to do it, of course, within their cultural context. But you can understand why it arose as it arose. And you can understand why the Roman Catholic Church did what it did. And now we have the Orthodox increasingly in on the conversation. It's going to get very interesting because here we are, back to myth and and symbolism and all of what's going on there. So, yeah, yeah. What a really cool time to be alive. What a really cool part of the world to be in. What a really cool conversation to be having. It is just, I feel just so fortunate to have friends and conversation partners like we have right now. What an astounding thing. So I would offer to you that we do have our own Erasmus. And we do have our own Luther. And now Peterson isn't breaking up the church like Luther did. He's probably breaking up the academy, his own church. And Christianity is the religion that's not a religion. All the way back to the Hebrew prophets. What a cool time to be alive. It's nice to be able to make a video again. I'm sure there will be comments. Let me know what you think.